Okay, everyone. So we've messed with uh, nouns and adjectives and prepositions. And now we are really going to dive into the thick of things by jumping into verbs. So what I've done with this lecture is I've given you some review from lectures one and two, uh, where we learned the 12 different tenses in English uh, and the three different voices. And now we're going to move into the Greek version of all this to allow you to start um, playing with some of the verbal uh, interpretations. So um, just a quick nuance, you'll notice that the name of this section is finite verbs. And this is to contrast with infinitive verbs. Um, in English, this is usually uh, an infinitive verb is usually the preposition to plus the verbal idea, so to run, to jump, or to play, or something like that. We're not going to be dealing with infinitives this week. That will be later on in the semester. We're just going to be dealing with finite forms of the verb in Greek. So a finite verb in Greek, uh, much like English, uh, has different characteristics, uh, five to be exact, person, number, tense, voice, and mood. Now we, we specifically dealt with tense and voice, um, but all English verbs have uh, person and number as well, um, and you can see these below. So there are six different possibilities uh, in, in Greek for the uh, vo person and number. Um, it's either first, second, or third person, and singular or plural is the number. Uh, we usually denote this in English by using the pronouns that I've listed here. Uh, so a first person singular verb would be I, a first person plural verb uh, would begin with we as the subject. So I ran, we ran, uh, you ran, you ran, he, she, or it ran, they ran uh, would be a uh, would be all the different forms for first, uh, second, third person singular or plural simple past tense. Okay. Um, I've given you some examples here that I'm not going to get too much into that just kind of run you through how all that works in English. Um, and I want to quickly move you uh, on to the meat of this lecture, which uh, is going to be the tense and the voice. Um, you'll notice that I'm skipping over mood. That's because uh, there are several moods in Greek. Uh, we're only going to be dealing with the indicative mood, which you don't need to worry too much about right now. Suffice it to say that it's known as the mood of, re of assumed reality. So uh, we're just dealing with uh, the mood of verbs that people use when they assume that what they're saying is actually real or happening. Um, believe it or not, there are more ways of speaking than just that. So uh, we're going to be dealing with the uh, primarily with the six different tenses in Greek, the present, the imperfect, the aorist, the future, the perfect, and the pluperfect. So uh, these tenses are um, generally I've, I've paired them up. So the present and the imperfect tend to work in similar ways, the aorist in the future and the perfect and the pluperfect. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the present tense is an ongoing or a continuous repeated action in the present, whereas an imperfect is the same thing, but in the past. So for example, um, I am going would be a present tense. I was going is imperfect. Notice, notice the present continuous and the past continuous that we learned uh, in weeks one and two. The aorist and the future are completed or indefinite actions in the in the past or the future. Um, so the idea is more static, like um, instead of I am going, it would be something like I went and I will go. Okay, uh, so there's less of the idea that it's in the process of happening, um, and it's either in the past or the future. And then the perfect and the pluperfect are actions continuing from a completed event. Uh, that's a perfect tense. So um, I have gone would mean that I started going at some point in the past, but the effects of that going um, are continuing on into the present. Okay, uh, and then the pluperfect, which is pretty rare, but it does happen, 
is an action finished in the past, um, but is continuing, uh, sorry, an action that has happened in the past and continued on, but has the continuation has now completed um, and in, in the past. And that's usually just translated, I had gone. In other words, at some point in the past, I had started going and I continue to do that, but then at some point terminated that before my present state. I know it's a little confusing, but I've got a nice handy chart at the end of this that will help you put that all together. Okay, um, I've got some nice uh, information there for you for background. Uh, ignore all references to Logos. I just that was the old software we had to use, so now it's accordance unless you are still have Logos. Um, and then I give you some um, examples in each of the six tenses. Now. I didn't write anything in here about voice because voice functions exactly the same way in Greek as it does in English. Your your software will tell you either it's present or I'm sorry, uh, it's active, middle, or passive. Okay, um, and you're just going to have to remember how to translate an active verb. That is, the subject is doing the activity to an object. A middle. Um, which is the subject doing the activity to itself, uh, and then a passive, the subject being acted upon, okay, by the verb. I raised him is active. I raised myself is middle. I was raised is passive. All right. So here's what you're going to be doing um, in your homework. You'll be asked to look up certain verses like you always are and find the different tenses within them. And you're going to use these charts uh, to help you translate those verbs okay, um, in a particular way. So just like you would say, this is a genitive and it's functioning uh, uh, as a genitive of separation. Likewise, when you find a present tense, you're going to have four different options. What I've given you is the name of the option here, a graph of the past, present, and future that gives you an idea of what it's supposed to seem like as far as the transition of time. So it's like a moment in the present for the instantaneous. And a translation example would be something like, he goes, as opposed to he is going. Okay, which is the next one, which is called progressive. So a progressive present has more the idea that it's con it's a continuing spectrum within the present, and it's translated he is going. An iterative present is is referencing several activities that happen in succession in the present. So often we would translate this in English as he goes repeatedly. Okay, so you're adding in an adverb there to uh, give the sense, and you'll see where this uh, occurs. Uh, there's some pretty clear examples. And then there's what's called the gnomic present. This is uh, likely how the verse God is love um, is meant to uh, be translated or understood, and that is it's saying something about the subject that's true throughout time and space okay so he goes that that that's the idea even though it looks exactly the same as the first one instantaneous here the the idea is that it's almost central to the subjects being that they go okay um, in other words they are always going and have always gone is kind of the idea god has always loved us and has, uh, and has always loved uh, so god is love all right okay uh, so that's uh, those are the four different options for the present tense you'll notice that the imperfect tense has some very similar ones but in the past minus the instantaneous okay so you have a progressive imperfect translated he was going giving the sense of uh, a wide range of time in the past uh, you have the ingressive imperfect, which gives the idea that uh, of the starting point, but then the continuation. So he began going. We're focusing on the spot in which he began to go. Okay, and then iterative. He was going repeatedly, or he went repeatedly. Okay, those are your options for that. Then we move on to the aorist and the future. Um, you'll notice that for the aorist, uh, I don't have any of those graphs and only one for the future. 
and that's for several reasons that I really just don't have the time to, or nuance to get into here. Um, but you have uh, the constative, which is like a simple action, which is very similar to the instantaneous present. Um, the ingressive, so just like the ingressive imperfect here, it's he began to go, or he began to see, or he began to run. Uh, but it's um, a different tense, though it sounds the same. Okay, uh, the consummative or culminative aorist um, is focusing on the sense, the cessation of an activity with its continuing effects, and then the epistolary aorist, um, which is used by an author to describe events from their time, from the time frame of the audience reading it. This is the hardest one uh, that you'll have to deal with, but know that it only happens the, in the epistles, so you don't have to worry about it in the gospels. Um, but the, the idea is, if I was writing a letter to you now and then sending someone to deliver it to you, I'm writing from the perspective of the future of you then reading a letter that I had written long before. Okay, so uh, he has written. Even though I'm currently writing it, I, set, I, I put it in the past perfect because um, from your perspective when you're watching this or reading this, um, it happened in my past. Okay? Um, gets really hairy. <laughs> future tense. Uh, the predictive future um, is simply someone predicting what will happen. He will go. Uh, there's no proof of that. The assumption is that the person has some sort of knowledge and they're predicting that that will be the case. The imperatival future tends to happen a lot when the uh, when Deuteronomy is being translated and it's uh, basically a command. So um, this it's kind of like uh, you shall go. Okay, um, so that's the idea there. You shall go. All right. Uh, the uh, and then finally, the deliberative future is when a question is being asked and it says something like, "Should you go?" Um, it, it's it's inviting another person into the conversation uh, with a future with a future tense verb. Okay, so those are your three futures. And then finally, we have our perfect and our pluperfect. They're going to mimic each other almost exactly, except you'll notice for the perfect tense, um, you're going to be focused on the past moving into the present, whereas the pluperfect, you're just in the past. This is one that has particular significance exegetically for us as we're interpreting passages because we don't have anything in English that really functions this way. Um, but you have three options for both of these. Um, the first being the intensive or resultative perfect. Um, so what what I want you to hear in this one is uh, when you decide that a perfect tense is functioning this way, you're putting an emphasis on uh, the continuation of the action, not on the point in the past. Whereas with the extensive consummative, um, you're focusing on uh, the completion of the event, not its continuing effects. So it's really how you want to nuance it. And in English, it tends to be, um, for the first option, translating it like a, um, continuing or a um, present continuous, whereas it looks more like a present perfect, uh, when you're translating it the second way. Um, and then the third way is just translating it almost like a gnomic, uh, um, he knows uh, or an instantaneous present okay and then likewise uh, with the pluperfect you are doing the same thing only you're using the past tense either you're emphasizing the line here that is the continuation or you're emphasizing the point uh, which is the uh, the completed event that had continuing effects okay um, and then finally Past force, uh, just like the present force, is translated like a past tense. He knew. Finally, um, and I just want to emphasize this here, um, when you're looking at your parsing, if you see the word deponent, um, then treat it like an active verb. 
Okay, um, that's there's some explanation here, but just suffice it to say that a deponent will look like it's middle or passive, but it's actually functioning actively. We won't get into all the nuances of why that's the case. Um, there are some interesting reasons why, um, but just, just know that if it says deponent, you're going to treat it uh, like uh, an active verb, okay, the active voice. All right, so you should be getting, uh, you'll also be getting uh, a quick tutorial on how to do the homework and I hope you enjoy jumping into verbs this week.